Mr. H. A Farce by Charles Lamb. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. H. Read by Peter Bishop. Landlord Pry. Read by Martin Geeson. Nigel Carrington reading the character Belleville. Melisinda. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. First Waiter. Read by Rick F. Second Waiter. Read by Phil Chenevere. Third Waiter. Read by Algie Pug. Fourth Waiter. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Fifth Waiter. Read by Marty Chris. First Gentleman. Read by Lars Rolander. Second Gentleman. Read by Max Schörlinge. First Footman. Read by Brian Morgan. Second Footman. Read by Algy Pug. Gentleman. Read by Algy Pug. First Lady. Read by Carol Box. Second Lady. Read by Sarah Crampton. Third Lady. Read by Mill Nicholson. Fourth Lady. Read by Mullane. Fifth Lady. Read by Amy Graymore. Sixth Lady. Read by Martin Geeson. Old Lady. Read by Mill Nicholson. Susan. Read by Goldfish. Maid. Read by Beth Thomas. Narrator. Read by Algie Pug. Mr. H. A Farce by Charles Lamb. As it was performed at Drury Lane Theatre, December 1806. Mr. H. Thou wert damned. Bright shone the morning on the playbills that announced thy appearance and the streets were filled with the buzz of persons asking one another if they would go to see Mr. H., and answering that they would certainly. But before night the gaiety, not of the author, but of his friends in the town, was eclipsed, for thou wert damned. Hadst thou been anonymous, thou haply mightst have lived, but thou didst come to an untimely end for thy tricks, and for want of a better name to pass them off. Theatrical Examiner The action of the play takes place in Bath. Prologue, spoken by Mr. H. If we have sinned in paring down a name, all civil well-bred authors do the same. Survey the columns of our daily writers. You'll find that some initials are great fighters. How fierce the shock, how fatal is the jar, when Ensign W meets Lieutenant R. With two stout seconds just of their own gizzard, Cross Captain X and rough old General Izzard. Letter to letter spreads the dire alarms, Till half the alphabet is up in arms. Nor with less lustre have initials shone To grace the gentler annals of crime con, Where the dispensers of the public lash Soft penance give a letter and a dash, Where vice reduced in size shrinks to a failing And loses half her grossness by curtailing. Faux pas are told in such a modest way, The affair of Colonel B with Mrs. A. You must forgive them, for what is there, say, Which such a pliant vow must not grant To such a very pressing consonant? Or who poetic justice dares dispute When, mildly melting at a lover's suit, The wife's a liquid, her good man a mute? Even in the homelier scenes of honest life, The coarse-spun intercourse of man and wife, Initials, I am told, have taken place of dearie, spouse, and that old-fashioned race, and cabbage asked by brother Snip to tea replies, I'll come, but it don't rest with me, I always leave them things to Mrs. C. Oh, should this mincing fashion ever spread from names of living heroes to the dead, how would ambition sigh and hang their head as each loved syllable should melt away? Her Alexander turned into great A. A single C her Caesar to express, Her Scipio shrunk into a Roman S, And nicked and docked to these new modes of speech, Great Hannibal himself a Mr. H. End of Prologue Act One, Scene One A public room in an inn, Landlord, waiters, gentlemen, etc. Enter Mr. H. Landlord, has the man brought home my boots? yes sir you have paid him there is the receipt sir only not quite filled up no name only blank 
blank doctor to zekiel spanish for one pair of best hessians now sir he wishes to know what name he shall put in who he shall say doctor why mr h to be sure so i told him sir but zekiel has some qualms about it he says he thinks that mr h only would not stand good in law rot his impertinence bid him put in nebuchadnezzar and not trouble me with his scruples <laughs> i shall sir exit enter a waiter sir squire level's man is below with a hair and a brace of pheasants for mr h give the man half a crown and bid him return my best respects to his master presents it seems will find me out with any name or no name enter second waiter sir the man that makes up the directory is at the door give him a shilling that is what these fellows come for he has sent up to know by what name your honour will please to be inserted sounds fellow i give him a shilling for leaving out my name not for putting it in this is one of the plaguy comforts of going anonymous exit second waiter enter third waiter two letters for mr h exit from ladies opens them this from melisinda to remind me of the morning call i promised the pretty creature positively languishes to be made mrs h i believe i must indulge her affectedly this from her cousin to bespeak me to some party i suppose opening it oh this evening tea and cards surveying himself with complacency dear h thou art certainly a pretty fellow i wonder what makes thee such a favourite among the ladies i wish it may not be owing to the concealment of thy unfortunate pshaw enter fourth waiter sir one mr print again is inquiring for you oh i remember the poet he is publishing by subscription give him a guinea and tell him he may put me down what name shall i tell him sir sounds he is a poet let him fancy a name exit fourth waiter enter fifth waiter sir bartle me the lame beggar that you sent a private donation to last monday has by some accident discovered his benefactor and is at the door waiting to return thanks oh poor fellow who could put it into his head now i shall be teased by all his tribe when once this is known well tell him i am glad i could be of any service to him and send him away i would have done so sir but the object of his call now he says is only to know who he is obliged to why me yes sir me 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 who else to be sure yes sir but he is anxious to know the name of his benefactor here is a pampered rogue of a beggar that cannot be obliged to a gentleman in the way of his profession but he must know the name birth parentage and education of his benefactor i warrant you next he will require a certificate of one's good behaviour and a magistrate's license in one's pocket lawfully empowering so-and-so to give an arms anything more yes sir here has been mr patriot with the county petition to sign and mr failtime that owes so much money has sent to remind you of your promise to bail him neither of which i can do while i have no name here is more of the plaguy comforts of going anonymous that one can neither serve one's friend nor one's country damn it a man had better be without a nose than without a name i will not live long in this mutilated dismembered state i will to melisinda this instant and try to forget these vexations melisinda there is music in the name but then hang it there is none in mine to answer to it exit while mr h has been speaking two gentlemen have been observing him curiously who the devil is this extraordinary personage who oh, why tis mr h has he no more name none that has yet transpired no more why that single letter has been enough to inflame the imaginations of all the ladies in bath he has been here but a fortnight and is already received into all the first families wonderful yet nobody knows who he is or where he comes from oh, he is vastly rich gives away money as if he had infinity dresses well as you can see 
and for address, the mothers are all dying for fear the daughters should get him, and for the daughters he may command them as absolutely as <clears throat> Melisinda, the rich heiress, is thought, will carry him. And is it possible that a mere anonymous— Who, <laughs> that is the charm. Who is he, and what is he? What is his name? The man with the great nose on his face never excited more of the gaping passion of wonderment in the dames of Strasbourg than this newcomer with a single letter to his name has lighted up among the wives and maids of Bath. His simply having lodgings here draws more visitors to the house than an election. Come with me to the parade, and I will show you more of him. Exeunt. Scene two in the street mr h walking belville meeting him my old jump baker schoolfellow that i've not seen for so many years it must it can be no other than jack going up to him my dear ho stopping his mouth oh the devil hush why sure it is it is it is your old friend jack that shall be nameless my dear ho stopping him don't name it believe what my cursed unfortunate name i have reasons to conceal it for a time i understand you creditors jack no i assure you snapped up a ward per adventure and the whole chancery at your heels i don't use to travel with such cumbersome luggage you haven't taken a purse to relieve you at once from all disgraceful conjectures you must know tis nothing but the sound of my name ridiculous well, tis true yours is none of the most romantic but what can that signify in a man you must understand that i am in some credit with the ladies with the ladies and truly i think not without some pretensions my fortune sufficiently splendid if i may judge from your appearance my figure airy gay and imposing my parts bright my conversation equally remote from flippancy and taciturnity but then my name damn my name childish not so oh belleville you are blessed with one which sighing virgins may repeat without a blush and for it change the paternal but what virgin of any delicacy and i require some in a wife would endure to be called mrs <laughs> most absurd did not clementina falconbridge the romantic clementina falconbridge fancy tommy potts and rosabella sweetlips sacrifice her mellifluous appellative to jack deddy matilda her cousin married a gubbins and her sister amelia a clutterbuck potts is tolerable deddy is sufferable gubbins is bearable and clutterbuck is endurable but ho hush jack don't betray yourself but are you really ashamed of the family name ay and of my father that begot me and my father's father and all their forefathers that have borne it since the conquest but how do you know the women are so squeamish i have tried them i tell you there is neither maiden of sixteen nor widow of sixty but would turn up their noses at it i have been refused by nineteen virgins twenty-nine relics and two old maids that was hard indeed jack parsons have stuck at publishing the bands because they averred it was a heathenish name parents have lingered their consent because they suspected it was a fictitious name and rivals have declined my challenges because they pretended it was an ungentlemanly name <laughs> but what course do you mean to pursue to engage the affections of some generous girl who will be content to take me as mr h mr h yes that is the name i go by here you know one likes to be as near the truth as possible certainly but what then to get her consent you to accompany me to the altar without a name in short to suspend her curiosity that is all till the moment the priest shall pronounce the irrevocable charm which makes two names one and that name and then she must be pleased huh jack exactly such a girl it has been my fortune to meet with harkey whispers musing yet hang it tis cruel to betray her confidence but the family name jack as you say the family name must be perpetuated though it be but a homely one true but come i will show you the house where dwells this credulous melting fair 
my old friend dwindled down to one letter. Exeunt. Scene three, an apartment in Melisinda's house. Melisinda Sola, as if musing. H, H, H. Sure, it must be something precious by its being concealed. It can't be Homer, that is a heathen's name, nor Horatio, that is no surname. What if it be Hamlet, the Lord Hamlet, pretty, and I his poor distracted Ophelia? No, it is none of these. Tis Harcourt or Hargrave, or some such sounding name. Or Howard, high-born Howard, that would do. Maybe it is Harley. Methinks my H resembles Harley, the feeling Harley. But I hear him, and from his own lips I will once for ever be resolved. Enter Mr. H. My dear Melisinda. My dear H. That is all you give me power to swear allegiance to, to be enamoured of inarticulate sounds, and call with sighs upon an empty letter. But I will know. My dear Melisinda, press me no more for the disclosure of that, which in the face of day so soon must be revealed. Call it whim, humour, caprice in me. Suppose I have sworn an oath never, till the ceremony of our marriage is over, to disclose my true name. O, oh, H, 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 I cherish here a fire of restless curiosity which consumes me. His appetite, passion, call it whim, caprice in me. Suppose I have sworn I must and will know it this very night. Ungenerous Melisinda, I implore you to give me this one proof of your confidence. The holy vow, once passed, your H shall not have a secret to withhold. My H has overcome. His Melisinda shall pine away and die before she dare express a saucy inclination. But what shall I call you till we are married? Call me? Call me anything. Call me love. Love. I love. Love will do very well. How many syllables is it, love? How many? Uh, that is coming to the question with a vengeance. One, two, three, four. What does it signify how many syllables? How many syllables, love? My Melisinda's mind, I had hoped, was superior to this childish curiosity. How many letters are there in it? Exit Mr. H, followed by Melisinda repeating the question. Scene 4. A room in the inn. Two waiters disputing. Sir Harbottle Hammond, you may depend upon it. Sir Hardy Hardcastle, I tell you. The Hammonds of Huntingdonshire. The Hardcastles of Hertfordshire. The Hammonds. Don't tell me, does not Hardcastle begin with an H? So does Hammond, for that matter. Faith, so it does, if you go to spell it. I did not think of that. I began to be of your opinion. He is certainly a Hammond. Here comes Susan Chambermaid. Maybe she can tell. Enter Susan. Well, well Susan, Susan, have you, have you heard, heard anything, anything the who the strange gentleman is? Gentleman is? How dare you heard? It's all come out. Mrs. Guestwell, the parson's widow, has been here about it. I overheard her talking in confidence to Mrs. Setter and Mrs. Pointer, and she says they were holding a sort of, um, committee about it. What? 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 There can't be a doubt of it, she says, what from his figure and the appearance he cuts and his sumptuous way of living, and above all from the remarkable circumstance that his surname should begin with an H, that he must be... Well, 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 neither more nor less than the prince. Prince? prince. The prince of Hesse Cassel, in disguise. Very, very likely, very, very likely. likely. Well, there can't be a doubt on it. Mrs. Guestwell says she knows it. Now, if we could be sure that the prince of Hesse, what do you call him, was in England on his travels. Get a newspaper. Look in the newspapers. Fiddle of the newspapers. Who else can it be? That, that is, is very, very true. true. Gravely. Into landlord. Here, Susan, James, Philip, where are you all? The London coaches come in, and there is Mr. Fillerside, the 
fat passenger has been bawling for somebody to help him off with his boots the chambermaid and waiters slip out landlord solus oh, the house has turned upside down since the strange gentleman came into it nothing but guessing and speculating and speculating and guessing waiters and chambermaids getting into corners and speculating ostlers and stable boys speculating in the yard oh, i believe the very horses in the stable are speculating too for there they stand in a musing posture nothing for them to eat and not seeming to care whether they have anything or no and after all what does it signify i hate such curious Odd so i must take this box up into his bedroom he charged me to see to it myself i hate such inquisitive i wonder what is in it it feels heavy reads leases title deeds wills here now a man might satisfy his curiosity at once deeds must have names to them so must leases and wills but i wouldn't no i wouldn't it is a pretty box too prettily dovetailed i admire the fashion of it much but i'd cut my fingers off before i do such a dirty what have i to do curse the keys how they rattle rattle in one's pockets the keys are the halfpence. takes out a bunch and plays with them i wonder if any of these would fit or might just try them but i wouldn't lift up the lid if they did oh no what should i be the richer for knowing all this time he tries the keys one by one what's his name to me a thousand names begin with an h i hate people that are always prying poking and prying into things thrusting their finger into one place a mighty little hole this and their keys into another oh lord little rusty fits it but what is that to me i wouldn't go to no no but it is odd little rusty should just happen while he is turning up the lid of the box mr h enters behind him unperceived what are you about you dog oh, oh lord sir pardon no thief as i hope to be saved little pry was always honest what else could move you to open that box sir don't kill me and i will confess the whole truth this box happened to be lying that is i happen to be carrying this box and i happen to have my keys out and so little rusty happened to fit so little rusty happened to fit and would not a rope fit that rogue's neck i see the papers have not been moved all is safe but it was as well to frighten him a little aside come landlord as i think you honest and suspect you only intended to gratify a little foolish curiosity that was all sir upon my veracity for this time i will pass it over your name is pry i think yes sir jeremiah pry at your service an apt name you have a prying temper i mean some little curiosity a sort of inquisitiveness about you ah a natural thirst after knowledge you may call it sir when a boy i was never easy but when i was thrusting up the lids of some of my schoolfellows boxes not to steal anything upon my honour sir only to see what was in them to have had pens stuck in my eyes for peeping through keyholes after knowledge <laughs> could never see a cold pie with the legs dangling out at top but my fingers were for lifting up the crust just to try if it were pigeon or partridge for no other reason in the world surely i think my passion for nuts was owing to the pleasure of cracking the shell to get at something concealed more than to any delight i took in eating the kernel 
in short sir this appetite has grown with my growth you will certainly be hanged some day for peeping into some bureau or other just to see what is in it <laughs> that is my fear sir the thumps and kicks i have had for peering into parcels and turning of letters inside out just for curiosity the blankets i have been made to dance in for searching parish registers for old ladies ages just for curiosity once i was dragged through a horse-pond only for peeping into a closet that had glass doors to it while my lady blue garters was undressing just for curiosity <laughs> a very harmless piece of curiosity truly and now mr pry first have the goodness to leave that box with me and then do me the favour to carry your curiosity so far as to inquire if my servants are within i shall sir here david jonathan i think i hear them coming <laughs> shall make bold to leave you sir exit another tolerable specimen of the comforts of going anonymous enter two footmen you speak first no you had better speak you promise to begin they have something to say to me the rascals want their wages raised i suppose there is always a favour to be asked when they come smiling well poor rogues service is but a hard bargain at the best i think i must not be close with them well david well jonathan we have served your honour faithfully hope your honour won't take offence the old story i suppose wages that's not it your honour you speak but if your honour would just be pleased to only be pleased to be quick with what you have to say for i'm in haste just to let us know who it is who it is we have the honour to serve why me 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 you serve me yes sir but we do not know who you are childish curiosity do not you serve a rich master a gay master an indulgent master ah sir the figure you make is to us your poor servants the principal mortification when we get over a pot of the public-house or in a gentleman's kitchen or elsewhere as poor as servants must have their pleasures when the question grows round who is your master and who do you serve and one says i serve lord so-and-so and another i am a squire's such a one's footman we have nothing to say for it but that we serve mr h or squire each really you are a couple of pretty modest reasonable personages but i hope you will take it as no offence gentlemen if upon a dispassionate review of all that you have said i think fit not to tell you any more of my name that i have chosen for especial purposes to communicate to the rest of the world why then sir you may suit yourself we tell you plainly we cannot stay we don't choose to serve mr h nor any mr or squire in the alphabet that lives in criss-cross row go for a couple of ungrateful inquisitive senseless rascals go hang starve or drown rogues to speak thus irreverently of the alphabet i shall live to see you glad to serve old q to curl the wig of great s adjust the dot of little i stand behind the chair of x y z wear the livery of etc and ride behind the sulky of and by itself and exit in a rage end of act one Act Two of Mr. H. A Farce by Charles Lamb. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Mr. H. A Farce by Charles Lamb. Act Two. Scene One A handsome apartment, well lighted. Tea, cards, etc a large party of ladies and gentlemen among them melisinda i wonder when the charming man will be here he is a delightful creature such a polish such an air in all that he does or says 
be gifted with a strong understanding but has your ladyship the remotest idea of what his true name is they say his very servants do not know it his french valet that has lived with him these two years there madam i must beg leave to set you right my coachman i have it on the very best authority my footman then madam you have set your servants on no madam i would scorn any such little mean ways of conning at a secret for my part i don't think any secret of that consequence that's just like me i make a rule of troubling my head with nobody's business but my own but then she takes care to make everybody's business her own and so to justify herself that way aside my dear melissinda you look thoughtful nothing give it a name perhaps it is nameless as the object come never blush nor deny it child bless me what great ugly thing is that that dangles at your bosom this it is a cross how do you like it a cross well to me it looks for all the world like a great staring h here a general laugh <laughs> oh. malicious creatures believe me it is a cross and nothing but a cross a cross i believe you would willingly hang at oh, intolerable spite mr h is announced enter mr h oh mr h we are so glad we have been so dull so perfectly lifeless you owe it to us to be more than commonly entertaining ladies this is so obliging oh mr h those ranunculus you said were dying pretty things they have got up i have worked that sprig you commended i want you to come ladies la 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 i have sent for that piece of music from london the mozart seeing melisinda melisinda nay, nay positively, positively melisinda. melisinda you shan't, you shan't engross him all to yourself. yourself while the ladies are pressing about mr h the gentleman shows signs of displeasure we shan't be able to edge in a word now this coxcomb is come damn him i will affront him sir with your leave i have a word to say to one of these ladies if we could be heard the ladies pay no attention but to mr h you see gentlemen how the matter stands <laughs> i am not my own master positively i exist and breathe but to be agreeable to these did you speak and affects absence of mind puppy who spoke of absence of mind did you madam how do you do lady werewell how do i did not see your ladyship before what was i about to say oh absence of mind i am the most unhappy dog in that way sometimes spurt out the strangest things the most malapropos without meaning to give the least offence upon my honour sheer absence of mind things i would have given the world not to have said do you hear the coxcomb great wits they say your fine geniuses are most given men of bright parts are commonly too vivacious but you shall hear i was to dine the other day at a great nabob's that must be nameless who between ourselves is strongly suspected of being very rich that's all john my valet who knows my foible cautioned me while he was dressing me as he usually does where he thinks there's a danger of my committing a lapsus to take care in my conversation how i made any allusion direct or indirect to presents you understand me i set out double charged with my fellow's consideration and my own and to do myself justice behaved with tolerable circumspection for the first half hour or so till at last a gentleman in company who was indulging a free vein of raillery at the expense of the ladies, stumbled upon that expression of the poet, which calls them fair defects. It is Pope, I believe, who says it. No, madam, Milton. Where was I? Oh, fair defects. This gave occasion to a critic in company to deliver his opinion on the phrase. That led to an enumeration of all the various words which might have been used instead of defect. As want absence poverty deficiency lack this moment i who had not been attending to the progress of the argument as the denouement will show 
starting suddenly up out of one of my reveries by some unfortunate connection of ideas which the last fatal word had excited the devil put it into my head to turn round to the nabob who was sitting next to me and in a very marked manner as it seemed to the company to put the question to him pray sir what may be the exact value of a lakh of rupees you may guess the confusion which followed what a distressing circumstance to a delicate mind how embarrassing i declare i quite pity you poppy a baronet at the table seeing my dilemma jogged my elbow and a good-natured duchess who does everything with a grace peculiar to herself trod on my toes at that instant this brought me to myself and covered with blushes and pitied by all the ladies i withdrew how charmingly he tells a story but how distressing lord squander council who is my particular friend was pleased to rally me in his inimitable way upon it next day i shall never forget a sensible thing he said on the occasion speaking of absence of mind my foible he says my dear hogs hogs, hogs? what what ha <gasps> huh? my dear hogsflesh my name here a universal scream oh 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 my cursed unfortunate tongue h i mean where was i filthy abominable unutterable hogs Filth. disgusting vile oh shocking odious hogs pop a smelling bottle look to miss melisinda poor thing it is no wonder you had better keep off from her mr hogsflesh and not be pressing about her in her circumstances good time of day to you mr hogsflesh the compliments of the season to you mr hogsflesh this is too much flesh and blood cannot endure it what flesh hogs flesh how he sets up his bristles bristles he looks as fierce as a hog in armour a hog madam here he severally accosts the ladies who by turns repel him extremely obliged to you for your attentions but don't want a partner greatly flattered by your preference but believe i shall remain single shall always acknowledge your politeness but have no thoughts of altering my condition always be happy to respect you as a friend but you must not look for anything further no doubt of your ability to make any woman happy but have no thoughts of changing my name must tell you sir that if by your insinuations you think to prevail with me you have got the wrong sow by the ear does he think any lady would go to pig with him mm, must beg you to be less particular in your addresses to me does he take me for a jew to long after forbidden meats i shall go mad to be refused by old mother damnable she that so old nobody knows whether she was ever married or no but passes for a maid by courtesy her juvenile exploits being beyond the farthest stretch of tradition old mother damnable exeunt all either pitying or seeming to avoid him scene two the street belville and another gentleman poor jack i'm really sorry for him the account which you give me of his mortifying change of reception at the assembly would be highly diverting if it gave me less pain to hear it with all his amusing absurdities and amongst them not the least a predominant desire to be thought well of by the fair sex he has an abundant share of good nature and is a man of honour notwithstanding all that has happened melisinda may do worse than take him yet but did the women resent it so deeply as you say oh, intolerably they fled him as fearfully when twas once blown as a man would be avoided who was suddenly discovered to have marks of the plague and as fast when before they had been ready to devour the foolishest thing he could say <laughs> so frail is the tenure by which these women's favourites commonly hold their envied preeminence well i must go find him out and comfort him i suppose i shall find him at the inn either there or at melisinda's adieu exeunt scene three mr h s apartment mr h solace 
was ever anything so mortifying to be refused by old mother damnable with such parts and address and the little squeamish devils to dislike me for a name a sound oh my cursed name that it was something i could be revenged on if it were alive that i might tread upon it or crush it or pummel it or kick it or spit it out for it sticks in my throat and will choke me my plaguy ancestors if they had left me but a van or a mac or an irish o it had been something to qualify it mynheer van hogsflesh or sawney mchogsflesh or sir phelim o hogsflesh but downright blunt if it had been any other name in the world i could have borne it if it had been the name of a beast as bull fox kid lamb wolf lion or of a bird as sparrow hawk buzzard door finch nightingale or of a fish as sprat herring salmon or the name of a thing as ginger hay wood or of a colour as black grey white green or of a sound as bray or the name of a month as march may or of a place as barnet baldock hitchin or the name of a coin as farthing penny twopenny or of a profession as butcher baker carpenter piper fisher fletcher fowler glover or a jew's name as solomon's isaac's jacob's or a personal name as foot leg crookshanks heavy side side bottom long bottom ram's bottom winter bottom or a long name as blunchenhagen or blunchenhausen or a short name as crib crisp crips tag trot tub phipps padge paps or prig or wig or pip or trip trip had been something but hot walks about in great agitation recovering his calmness a little sits down farewell the most distant thoughts of marriage the finger circling ring the purity fingering glove the envy pining bridesmaids the wishing parson and the simpering clerk farewell the ambitious blush raising joke the titter provoking pun the morning stirring drum no son of mine shall exist to bear my ill-fated name no nurse come chuckling to tell me it's a boy no midwife leering at me from under the lids of professional gravity i dreamed of caudle sings in a melancholy tone lullaby lullaby hushaby baby how like its papa it is makes motions as if he was nursing and then when grown up is this your son sir yes sir a poor copy of me a sad young dog just what his father was at his age i have four more at home oh 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 enter landlord landlord i must pack up to-night you will see all my things got ready hope your honour does not intend to quit the blue boar sorry anything has happened he has heard it all your honour has had some mortification to be sure as a man may say you have brought your pigs to a fine market pigs what then take old prize advice and never mind it don't scorch your crackling for em sir scorch my crackling a queer phrase but i suppose he don't mean to affront me what is done can't be undone you can't make a silken purse out of a sow's ear as you say landlord thinking of a thing does but augment it <laughs> does but augment it indeed sir augment it damn it i said augment it lord sir it is not everybody has such gift of fine phrases as your honour that can lard his discourse lard suppose they do smoke you smoke me oh, one of my phrases never mind my words sir my meaning is good we all mean the same thing only you express yourself one way and i another that's all the meaning's the same it is all pork that's another of your phrases i presume bell rings and landlord is called for anon anon oh i wish i were anonymous exeunt several ways scene four melisinda's apartment melisinda and maid lord madam before i take on as you do about a foolish what signifies a name hogs 
hogs what is it is just as good as any other for what i see ignorant creature yet she is perhaps blessed in the absence of those ideas which while they add a zest to the few pleasures which fall to the lot of superior natures to enjoy doubly edge the superior natures a fig if he's a hog by name he's not a hog by nature that don't follow his name don't make him anything does it he don't grunt the more for it nor squeak that ever i hear he likes his victuals out of a plate as other christians do you never see him go to the trough unfeeling wretch yet possibly her intentions for instance madam my name is finch betty finch i don't whistle the more for that nor long after canary seed while i can get good wholesome mutton no nor you can't catch me by throwing salt on my tail if you come to that hadn't i a young man used to come after me they say courted me his name was lyon francis lyon a tailor but though he was fond enough of me for all that he never offered to eat me how fortunate that the discovery has been made before it was too late had i listened to his deceits and as the perfidious man had almost persuaded me precipitated myself into an inextricable engagement before no great harm if you had you'd only have bought a pig in a poke and what then oh, here he comes creeping enter mr h abject go to her mr hogs uh, ho hogs bristles what's your name don't be afraid man don't give it up she's not crying only summit has made her eyes red she has got a sty in her eye i believe going you are not going betty oh madam never mind me i shall be back in the twinkling of a pig's whisker as they say exit melisenda you behold before you a wretch who would have betrayed your confidence but it was love that prompted him who would have tricked you by an unworthy concealment into a participation of that disgrace which a superficial world has agreed to attach to a name but with it you would have shared a fortune not contemptible and a heart but tis over now that name he is content to bear alone to go where the persecuted syllables shall be no more heard or excite no meaning some spot where his native tongue has never penetrated nor any of his countrymen have landed to plant their unfeeling satire their brutal wit and national ill manners where no englishman here melisinda who has been pouting during this speech fetches a deep sigh some yet undiscovered otaheite where witless unapprehensive savages shall innocently pronounce the ill-fated sounds and think them not inharmonious <sighs> who knows but among the female natives might be found Sir raising her head one who would be more kind than some oberea queen oberea oh or what if i were to seek for proofs of reciprocal esteem among unprejudiced african maids in monomotopa enter servant mr belleville exit enter belleville in monomotopa musing hey day jack what means this mortified face nothing has happened i hope between this lady and you I, I beg pardon madam but understanding my friend was with you i took the liberty of seeking him here some little difference possibly which a third person can adjust not a word will you madam as this gentleman's friend suffer me to be the arbitrator strange harky jack nothing has come out has there you, you understand me I oh i guess how it is somebody has got at your secret you haven't blabbed it yourself have you <laughs> I could find in my heart. Jack, what would you give me if I should relieve you? No power of man can relieve me. <sighs> but it must lie at the root, gnawing at the root. Here it will lie. No power of man. Not a common man, I grant you. For instance, a subject. It's out of the power of any subject. Gnawing at the root. There it will lie. Such a thing has been known as a name to be changed, but not by a subject. Shows a gazette. Gnawing at the root suddenly snatches the paper out of belleville's hand ha pish nonsense give it me what reads promotions bankrupts a great many bankrupts this week there it will lie lays it down takes it up again and reads the king has been graciously pleased gnawing at the root graciously pleased to grant unto john hogsflesh the devil hogsflesh esquire of stye hall in the county of hants his royal license and authority oh lord oh lord that he and his issue 
me and my issue may take and use the surname and arms of bacon bacon the surname and arms of bacon in pursuance of an injunction contained in the last will and testament of nicholas bacon esq his late uncle as well as out of grateful respect to his memory grateful respect poor old soul here's more and that such arms may be first duly exemplified they shall i will take care of that according to the laws of arms and recorded in the herald's office come madam give me leave to put my own interpretation upon your silence and to plead for my friend that now that only obstacle which seemed to stand in your way of your union is removed you will suffer me to complete the happiness which my news seems to have brought him by introducing him with a new claim to your favour by the name of mr bacon takes their hands and joins them which melisinda seems to give consent to with a smile generous melisinda my dear friend he and his issue me and my issue oh lord i wish you joy jack with all my heart bacon 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 how odd it sounds i could never be tired of hearing it there was lord chancellor bacon methinks i have some of the verulam blood in me already methinks i could look through nature there was a friar bacon a conjurer i feel as if i could conjure too enter a servant two young ladies and an old lady are at the door inquiring if you see company madame surname and arms show them up my dear mr bacon moderate your joy enter three ladies being part of those who were at the assembly my dear melisinda how do you do how do you do we have been so concerned for you we have been so concerned seeing mr h oh mr hogsflesh there's no such person nor there never was nor tis not fit there should be surname and arms it is true what my friend would express we have been all in a mistake ladies very true the name of this gentleman was what you call it but it is so no longer the succession to the long contested bacon estate is at length decided and with it my friend succeeds to the name of his deceased relative his majesty has been graciously pleased i am sure we all join in hearty congratulations <sighs> and wish you joy with all our hearts hi ho and hope you will enjoy the name and estate many years <laughs> ha <laughs> ha mortify them a little jack hope you intend to stay with us some time in these parts ladies for your congratulations i thank you for the favours you have lavished on me and in particular for this lady's turning to the old lady good opinion i rest your debtor as to any future favours it costs them severally in the order in which he was refused by them at the assembly madam shall always acknowledge your politeness but at present you see i am engaged with a partner always be happy to respect you as a friend but you must not look for anything further must beg of you to be less particular in your addresses to me ladies all with this piece of advice of bath and you your ever grateful servant takes his leave lay your plan surer when you plot to grieve see while you kindly mean to mortify another the wild arrow do not fly and gall yourself for once you've been mistaken your shafts have missed their aim hogsflesh has saved his bacon end of act two end of mr h a farce by charles lamb